and I literally said to myself, if this horse wins, you're okay. Like, you're not going to go to prison. Yes, you might lose your house and your job, but at least you can pay everybody back. Your life can continue. And if it doesn't, then I'm afraid your life can't. And that's it. Um, and I watched that horse race and... you uh standing on a on a train platform uh contemplating um and and ending your life um due to you know this addiction that you you talk about in depth and that we're going to talk about in depth today i wonder if you can or even if it's humanly possible to begin to explain the emotions that run through somebody's head in that situation yeah um Obviously, for me, life had reached a point where I just honestly didn't see a way out. Um, it felt like my addiction and my gambling had become a matter of life and death. And it honestly felt like the only thing and the right thing to do. Um, and it's always very difficult to explain when it comes to suicide which is a very complex um, thing and topic. Um, all I can say is that if you ever find yourself in that situation, people often say it's a very selfish act. And I, I can see why, because of what it leaves behind. But actually, when you are in that moment, you feel like you're doing the best thing for yourself and for the rest of the world and everybody else. And of course, it's never the solution. And nobody should ever feel like that but that's how i felt um and it then came to a point whilst i was stood there where i had an awful lot going through my mind and it was like well it's it's either life or death it's either i tell somebody or i don't and and that's it and it was at that point that my attention turned to other people and i finally started thinking about other people not just myself um, because I used the word selfish a minute ago, addiction does make you very selfish. And I was, and I was only thinking about myself at that point. And I, it was at that point that I thought, mm, what about everybody else? What about what this is going to do to everybody else? And I just felt like I could not do that. Um, and so that's why I, I reached out for help. And obviously it was the best thing I ever did. And unfortunately for me, my brother kind of responded to my cry for help. And as they say, the rest is history. And what was it about the uh, message you received from your brother that was enough to get you to step back from that train platform? I think in all honesty, there were a few things. It, it kind of it, it heightened that feeling of I can't do it to other people because there was this kind of just please don't do what you're about to do. Um, and although it was a message, I could almost sense the kind of desperation in, in his voice, as it were. Um, but it was also just the simplicity of what he said. It was, it was the fact that all he asked was that I talked about what was going on, that I was totally honest. And then I got the reassurance that he would stick by me and support me and, and I think that's one of your fears when you're in that situation or you've been battling an addiction or something similar is that one of your biggest concerns is that the people around you are gonna disown you and, and leave you and that reassurance really helped um, but it was almost like the judgment just went out the window it was, I don't really care what's going on I just want to know the truth um, and I think that was that was that was the, the big thing for me. You described at one point that it felt like you were keeping a, and, and the quote you use is a dirty secret. And that way of viewing addiction must make it almost impossible to think you could ever talk to somebody about it over the fear of uh, ridicule, over the fear of uh, uh, judgment. What did you fear would happen if you told your, your loved ones and friends 
long before you eventually did. Yeah, um, and I think you're absolutely right there. And, and I described it as a dirty secret because that's what it felt like and everything that went along with it, um, which obviously I'm not proud of at all. I, I think actually, weirdly, and we may touch on it at some point, I think the fact that it was gambling hmm. made it even worse. Um, and I often say to people, there are other addictions that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy, but I honestly think I would have found it easier to admit I had a problem with drugs or alcohol because possibly slightly more acceptable. Gambling, there was no way I could tell people it was gambling because whenever it was mentioned, it was it was always this, well, it's gambling, you're an idiot, just stop, um, which made it harder. Um, but I think... For me, going back to the original question, I think I'd lost everything except the people that I love. And that was the bit that I feared most um, because ultimately I had lost my house, I'd lost my job, I'd lost hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of money. It was that they were all that I had left. And of course, my life. Um, but as I just said, it, it felt like my life was worthless other than those people. And I thought to myself, well, if, if they're not going to be with me, then there's nothing worth living for. But of course, now I, I realise that, that there is. And fortunately for me, their reaction was very different to what I thought it was going to be. And the amount of people that I talk to who do have the bravery and the courage to speak up about whatever it is that their problem is. So often they say the way they played it in their head was very different to what actually happened. I think that a um, something that reaffirms uh, the beliefs of a lot of people struggling with, with gambling addiction that they, they can't talk about out of fear of ridicule is when you see someone, uh, a high profile person, um, come out and, and speak about gambling addiction or I mean, recently we, we've had the, the story of Ivan Tony, the footballer, um, who's been involved in a betting scandal and, and as um, you know, there's been points towards him having an addiction. And a lot of what you see online are people making sort of gambling related jokes or gambling memes around uh, this, this player who's obviously got a re you know, he's obviously got a problem. When you see something like that unfold online, does that make you sad? Because there's probably a lot of people out there struggling who, who lock on social media, see these things, and they think to themselves, well, I could never tell anyone if this is the reaction that these people get. Yeah, absolutely. I think stigma is a huge problem when it comes to addiction and, and mental health generally. A lot less so nowadays. It's a lot more talked about and we are breaking down those barriers and the stigma is being reduced, but there's something about gambling where it's so ingrained in culture and society, it's so normalized, but yet if you've got a problem with it, you're suddenly, it's not okay. Um, and that definitely needs to change. Um, but I think also, it's often not taken as seriously because it's not something that you put in your body that your body starts to kind of rely and depend on. So there's a kind of misunderstanding of it as an addiction in the sense that people think, oh, well, it can't be as bad. But in many ways, it's it's worse because of that. So, yeah, I, it, it does. I do find it hard. Um, but I also think that the narrative is changing and there are a lot more people talking about it um, there are a lot more individuals who have lived experience of gambling addiction who are prepared to share their story and, and talk about it and help people understand it um, than there were five, ten years ago. And, and I think that really does help break down those barriers. And of course, it was one of the motivations for, for me doing what I do now and, and writing my book. We saw a, a very famous case in the UK, I remember when I was younger, um, when it came to light, the, the Jeremy Kyle, um, who, you know, uh, who, who seemingly had this, you know, very, you know, uh, amazing life. He was very successful. He, you know, he had a lot of power, a lot of fame. 
Um, and he came out and said that he'd been suffering with a gambling addiction for, for many years to the point where I think he said he would have taken odds on whether it would have snowed in Trafalgar Square on, on Christmas Day. Um, and, and I remember that shocking a lot of people at the time. Um, what does that say in that, you know, someone who seems to have this, everything put together perfectly, can be suffering with something and the world is none the wiser. There was no inkling from the outside that there could be any problem going on because I think with stuff like alcohol or drugs, is you know, you can see it, but with gambling addiction, no one would have guessed that at that when Jeremy Kyle came up with that. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, it's often called the hidden or invisible addiction um, for good reason, because it is easier to hide because um, the physical signs aren't necessarily there or they can be very different for different people. Um, you don't smell of it can't see people doing it um, because ultimately most people now are doing it on their phones or on their computer. Everyone's on their phone and computer. You've always got a reason for doing it. No one questions it. Um, but also I, I think what's really interesting, um, and again, I think the world's wising up to this is that actually often it is people that you don't expect it to be and you can continue to be high functioning and you can continue to live a very normal life on the outside and inside it all going on um but i don't think that's sustainable forever and i think people will always be found out or do something about it and get the help that they need but i think it used to be that people think oh well with addiction I'll be able to tell because they'll start doing things that mean it's obvious. Actually, the reason you become so good at hiding it is because often you're bright and um, you, you've you've become very clever in in that way. So yeah, it is. It's terrifying that people continue to be high functioning, and often people don't have a clue. And and actually. That was definitely the case with me and, and has been the case with an awful lot of people um, until I would say in my case, right towards the end when I just, what I was doing just wasn't sustainable. Do you remember out, outside of maybe a family member, uh, you know, doing a bit of a sweepstake on the Grand National, do you remember the first time you placed a bet? Because I think for a lot of kids, especially in, in my experience uh, in school, there was always that one kid who um, was older than everyone else. And on his birthday, he would come into school and say, oh, guys, I'm old enough to place a bet now. And someone would say, oh, go and put five pound on Man United for me. And I think that's a lot of people's first introduction. Do you remember the first bet you placed? Yeah, I, I certainly do. I mean, as you just said, um, I can't say gambling was never part of my life um, when I was younger there are a lot of recovering gambling addicts gambling addicts who get introduced to it at, at very young ages in different ways whether that's kind of arcades machines whatever it might be a family member doing it um, it went on in my family but once a year grand national sweepstake um, it wasn't really it wasn't never my money it was my dad doing it for a bit of fun and that's all i knew about gambling um and it wasn't as accessible or as there as it is these days um so i do remember my first bet where it was actually felt like it was me um and that was on a roulette machine in a betting shop in in durham where i was at university um, and I put two pounds in a in a roulette machine. I put it all on green zero um, because it was the only number that was different from all the others. And it was the last number to come up. Um, and that was my reasoning for doing it and, and kind of being like I was. I thought, well, what are the chance of it happening twice in a row? And it happened. Um, first bet I ever placed was a winning bet, which I think is significant in itself. But two pounds became 72 pounds. And as I always say, my life from that moment on change forever. Do you think if you would have lost 
badly on that sort of first day that your story could have been a different one? Yeah, I do. I honestly do, because I think of the type of person I am, especially being super competitive and, and loving the feeling of winning, not being a very good loser. Um, I, I think I'll never know the answer. I don't, I can't say if, I hadn't won money that day that I would have never gambled again. But I think my gambling journey might have been very different. And I think the first bet being a winning bet was significant. And then, of course, later down the line, having a big win. I think often those two things are common denominators for people that may go on and experience um, serious issues with gambling. Um and I always say to people that the strangest thing is, and I didn't realize this until I stopped, but the feeling I got from winning the first bet, I basically spent the next 13 years trying to replicate. And of course, I was never going to be able to. Um, but yeah, that's that's the scary thing about it. Do you know a figure in um, across all the uh, bets you've placed across all the accounts? Do you know the the figure in terms of how much money um, you had wagered in, in bets throughout your sort of bet in Korea? Yeah, I mean, again, when I when I stopped, I kind of looked through some of this. Very hard to determine yeah. what I did in shops and casinos. Um, but online, I know that I transacted just shy of two million pounds worth of bets. Um, Obviously, that doesn't mean I lost no. two million pounds because the nature of gambling is that you do win and lose. And, and actually, that's what means it often goes on for a lot longer than you probably want it to because at times you do win. And yeah, I mean, it's frightening amounts of um, money and, and the figures generally associated with my addiction are pretty mind blowing. Um, but the. The other scary thing about it is I had no idea that any of that was the case. If you'd asked me how much money I'd spent, how much debt I was in, how many gambling accounts I had, how many loans I'd taken, I would not have had a clue. Um, but of course, when I stopped, it was then that I realised just the magnitude of it all. Yeah, as you say in there, so... Two million pounds in, in 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 sort of bets placed rather than money lost, but that's still a staggering amount. And I've when I've been looking into stories of gambling addiction, um, like when I read your book, I recently read Paul Merson's Hooked, another great book. Um, uh, addicts seem to describe, especially online gambling, as not so much as dealing with money, but almost playing with numbers on a screen. Is that how it felt to you, just numbers on a screen rather than actual, you know, hard-hitting money, cash in, cash out? It was just numbers on a game almost. Yeah, 100%. I mean, when my gambling moved online, which was pretty early on, to be honest, and, and how I did the majority of my gambling at the height of my addiction, the money didn't feel real. It, it felt like monopoly money, however you want to describe it. Um, I'd lost all value for, for money. Um, it was just a number. Um, also, no, no amount of money was going to ever, I know now, going to be enough for me. Um, it wasn't about what I won financially. It was about being in the moment, the chase. Um, is it going to win? Isn't it going to win? And then, obviously, the bigger the win, the kind of bigger the feeling. But it didn't matter to me financially really at all. Um, the main thing was, does this mean I can have another bet or not? Um, how big can the next bet be? Um, that was all I was bothered about really. Yeah. That was when I, well, when I know now that I had a serious addiction because I think if, you, if you're not addicted to it and, and you're gambling and it's not necessarily a problem, you do feel the wins and the losses and it, it is very real. Um, so I think that's a sure sign for anybody when actually it's not about the money anymore. When I first read your book and I came 
fascinated with this topic and started, as I mentioned, they're reading other books and digesting podcasts and talks around this topic. One thing that I became quite alarmed by and quite fascinated by is the accounts of, of um, gambling addicts who, who spoke about how if a, sometimes if a bet came in too early, they would feel disappointed. So if they put £100 on Man United to score against you know, Man City and Man United scored in the first five minutes, that they almost felt disappointed that it was over so fast, even if they won. Can, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, it, I can I can definitely relate to, to that feeling in the sense that obviously if you've placed a bet and the longer it kind of, you have to wait, the kind of more exciting it is and, and the, the greater the kind of feeling. Whereas actually, again, if it's not, a problem necessarily all you want to do is win the bet so actually if they score in the first minute there's almost a sense of relief you're yeah. delighted for me my gambling was always it was always about kind of frequency of doing it mm. so i can relate to it but i can also relate to probably a feeling of if i had a winning bet early on i then knew that during that game I'd potentially have more money to be able to gamble on it and put more bets on it so yeah it's it's bonkers in the sense that you your emotions around winning and losing when you're addicted to it are very different to what people who don't who gamble and don't have a problem or an addiction with it so as everyone starts out gambling, it's, it's normally 50 pence here, a pound there, and it, and it creeps up to 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, and, and 100 becomes the new norm, and then so on and so on. How did that sort of path look for you? How quickly did you get from the 50 pound bet to the 1,000 pound bet? What, what did that journey look like for you? Yeah, exactly as you just said. When, I, when you start out, you start out, generally with small amounts of money or it's relative to how much money you've had and what you can afford to lose and and for me whilst I was at university it was generally kind of smaller amounts of money um I probably was fortunate in the sense that I had more money than most people because of my situation playing professional cricket at the time and being paid to do that so I was probably gambling more than most people financially, but it, it was relative to me. Um, the big turning point for me was December 2010. The frequency of my gambling had kind of increased the whole time I was doing it. It was never, I gambled less. It was always more, 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 more in terms of how often I was gambling. But in terms of money, it was still similar amounts of money per bet or stake and then in December 2010 when I one night won £35,000 from a £500 bet on a football accumulator that was extraordinary because overnight I went from placing between 10 and £50 on a horse or a football bet to overnight I would be putting between 200 and a thousand pounds um overnight and once you start placing bigger bets and gambling more it's actually very difficult to gamble less mm -hmm. um if you get used to putting big stakes on and winning larger it's very hard to then go back to the and that was the big problem for me is I then lost that money in a matter of weeks and then I wanted it back and I started trying to win it back. And then when it had gone, I got myself into debt. But you'd, you'd think rationally, you'd think, well, when you then lost all that money, you'd go back to putting small bets on. Nah, almost bigger. Wow. So I appreciate this is this is hard to talk about. And this is why I encourage everyone to check the book out because you really do... Uh, you don't shy away from anything in the book. It, you know, it's a brilliant account of, of what I imagine it really must be like. Do you remember 
the first time you borrowed money to place a bet and how that sat with you morally at the time and how you justified it to yourself? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I think there's two very different answers to that. One is around the money that I'd borrowed off sort of banks, payday loans. Um, that was different as far as I was concerned. Um, it felt like, well, those kind of organizations exist to lend money to people that's what they're built on so there was there wasn't really a moral dilemma there there was of course a kind of emotional one from a stress point of view i mean when it comes to some of the payday loans i mean i wasn't obviously thinking rationally at all but i was i was borrowing small amounts of money and agreeing back to pay huge amounts but i just thought well that will enable me to gamble then once those had run out it was then that i started to turn to individuals um and i think the the biggest point at that that time was it was it was the depth of the lying that i was telling in order to get that money because it was almost like the bigger the lie the more likely it is that people are going to lend me money yeah or question or not want to question it and i mean morally yes i certainly quite i questioned it there were times where i was like wow i can't believe i've i've just said that but in order to feed my addiction that was the priority so i over time i started to just lose all my morals values and principles um and they kind of went out the window it was like well actually they're not as important to me as my addiction is so therefore i don't care um once i stopped god it makes me feel sick um now talking about it but at the time the honest answer is i didn't really care um and that's hard to admit but it's true but also the really scary thing about the borrowing is that almost becomes an addiction as well mm. because that's like a gamble in itself it's you reach out to somebody and say can i have x amount of money for this reason there's that moment where you're waiting for a response that is almost like waiting for the outcome of a bet and to me that became addictive um and it was almost like well if i can get that amount of money off somebody could i get twice that amount of money off somebody and that suspense was exhilarating and it's scary because it was basically that was just another way to gamble as far as i was concerned um but yeah it's it is it is frightening that's what I, I always say it changes you as a person because I'd lost those three things which actually matter so much to me when I'm not gambling. This was the the most uh, emotional and gripping part of your story when I was reading it, the, 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 this story around borrowing money and, and putting yourself in impossible situations. I, I mean, I, I think at one point you describe it as you felt like you were betting to stay out of jail um, when you... I think you won 58,000 after borrowing 10,000, was it? Yeah, that's right. So, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, if you could just explain to the audience how you got to that point where you felt like you were betting, you know, to stay out of jail and, and what that must have felt like to be backed in such a corner and, and, you know, feel like there's no other way out than winning. Yeah, um, that was sort of the culmination of everything was when... I would I would basically be found out or was on the cusp of, of being found out um, professionally. And I knew the implications of being found out were that I was going to lose my house, my job. And for me, one of the biggest concerns was going to prison because I knew that I had committed fraudulent behavior, forgery, theft. And I thought, well, I'm going to prison and it's always terrified me. Um, 
and I really didn't want to go to prison. And then at that point, when I knew it was going to be those, those were going to be the consequences, I then decided that, well, I'm going to gamble my way out of the problem. And that's the irony of a gambling addiction, which is different to other addictions. No alcoholic ever tries to drink themselves sober. But as a gambling addict, the only thing you ever think is going to solve the problem is gambling because you think, well, all I need to do is win, which has happened, rescue myself financially and everything will be okay. I obviously had no money at that point. So I borrowed £10,000 of somebody I'd already borrowed some money off, told them a lie I'm not proud of at all. And it was the start <clears throat> the Cheltenham Horse Racing Festival, which is probably the biggest horse racing festival in the world and certainly my biggest week of the year. And I honestly believed that that gave me the per perfect opportunity to turn £10,000 into half a million, which is the figure that I had in my mind that I needed to get rid of everything. Um, and during the festival, I gambled nonstop, not just on the horse racing, on anything and everything I won, I lost. And then on the Thursday, the penultimate day of the festival, having lost a lot of the money, I then had one bit of luck that will probably never happen again. And suddenly I had £58,000 across multiple accounts, which is an extraordinary amount of money. Um, it's a life-changing sum of money but to me at that moment in my life was nothing it was a tenth of the way to where I needed it to be but my but time was running out so I then just did the most stupid thing you could possibly imagine but weirdly what felt like the right thing to do and the only option I just decided to put it on one bet um, I put it on one horse and one horse race the Cheltenham Gold Cup in March 2018 and I literally said to myself if this horse wins you're okay. Like you're not going to go to prison. Yes, you might lose your house and your job, but at least you can pay everybody back. Your life can continue. And if it doesn't, then I'm afraid your life can't. And that's it. Um, and I watched that horse race and my whole world come crashing down when it, it didn't win, but weirdly there was no emotion. Um, I would, people say to me, go, I mean, I was sat in a lesson, for goodness sake. So that tells you how easy it was for me to, to hide. But I, it was literally just a matter of, well, if this happens, that happens. And if this happens, that happens. Um, there's no emotion whatsoever. Wow. So just for some context, um, at this point, when you said you were in a lesson, you're teaching a class of students. I, um, I think you said you, you gave them a mock exam to complete whilst you were watching this this race that you essentially bet your life on um at the front of the class and obviously the 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 horse doesn't win um and i think you described there's yeah you said there was no emotion you just clicked you clicked x out of the browser and you went and stayed out of a window um how certain were you at that point that that was that was it for you and that you were going to um you know take that um uh undescribable measure yeah i mean it was the most surreal and extraordinary kind of 45 minutes of, of my life that's for sure and as i stood staring out the window there was a kind of very eerie silence and at that point my attention kind of turned to well now i know that's happened how do i how do i do it um, how do I go about this? What now happens between now and then? What do I need to do? And um, that was that was my only focus. Um, in my mind at that time, I was certain that I was going to do it. The fact that I eventually reached out for help, some people might say it might be that you never wanted to do it. And although there were various other things that happened that people might describe as attempts, which I think they probably were. Um, yeah, it, it, it was, there was, a, there was an element of certainty, um, but fortunately it didn't happen. One question I'd, I'd love to ask you, and this is a major theme in your book, um, 
and a lot of people talk about this is how gambling uh, addiction can affect um, romantic relationships. Um, I you know reading stories online of people saying that they'd be in bed with their partner at night and like turned away from them with their phone under the blanket and you know what did your addiction what sort of impact did it have on one your romantic relationship but also the quality time you spend with your partner because again I, I read stories about people not being able to commit to actually doing any activities because they're always checking their phone they want to get the latest odds what was your experience like yeah i mean it, the impact that it has on relationships is is so big um a lot's made of kind of money actually the wider impact of it in, in terms of mental health sleep time opportunities all those are actually far greater than the money although the focus is always on the money when it came to my relationships i mean it decimated them my it, it certainly ruined a lot of relationships that i had my now wife who was my girlfriend at the time that was kind of the last 18 months of my addiction so weirdly she only ever knew me as that mm. and in that way and that made it easier for me to hide because it was almost like that's what i was like when she met me and she agreed to be with me so she didn't know any different whereas other people would have known different so it would have been easier for them to spot signs you use the word like presence there um i was never present in any situation because if i wasn't actually physically on my phone gambling placing a bet looking at a result finding out what was next to gamble on then i was thinking about it so so often i was in the room in a conversation but actually i, I wasn't there i just became incredibly good at hiding it but also it was easy to hide because everybody's on their phone all the time so i often think other people are like that they're just not gambling they're doing something else on their phone whether it's social media or messaging somebody or whatever um but the biggest thing in a relationship is the lying that's the hardest bit is because i was a compulsive gambler i was a compulsive liar so in any of my relationships whether it was a romantic relationship or family friends <clears throat> i was always lying about one thing which was my gambling and my addiction but i then almost lied about everything because it kept up in my mind that kind of mask that kind of jekyll and hyde um and that's the that's the bit that's difficult it's exhausting it's sort of draining mentally but that's the hard bit it's just the constant lying and i mean i didn't sleep properly for a long time because and, and as you just said i was the classic example of my girlfriend would be asleep next to me as she should be and in my mind it was like right well now's my opportunity to gamble guilt-free because she's asleep so i don't have to give her any attention and that's scary um, but yeah, the impact that it has on other people is, is so big. Um, and I think what's really scary about any addiction and a gambling addiction is no different is those relationships are then impacted because weirdly the, the people around you almost then start to protect the addiction as well. Um, my mum, she really struggled mentally and to an extent physically during my addiction but she never told me that because she was so worried about what I would react if I'd known that it, it might have triggered me into doing something sooner and it was almost like she was weirdly protect allowing the addiction to go on by hiding the impact that it was having on her it's interesting the way you talk about it being easy to hide um what i'd love to, to to ask you about is is how what warning signs you can look for um 
you know, if, if someone you know maybe maybe suffering with a gambling addiction, I think I think back to university and I remember I had one friend and he was he he loved football. So whether he was watching football twenty four hours a day, it was never anything alarming about it. Like you could walk into his, his you know, you know, it was like in university, you could walk into his room at like one o'clock in the morning to chill and he'd be watching like the the Brazilian B League and you could almost think nothing of it because he loved football so much. You just thought, oh, that's so-and-so. He loves football. Of course, he's watching every league in the world. And then it's not until hindsight you think back to, well, now if I saw someone doing that, that'd be quite an alarming thing to me. So for you as someone who, who suffered with a gambling addiction, what are some of the the major warning signs that you could give someone to look out for? How would you recognize someone with a gambling addiction? Yeah, in terms of, of spotting signs in somebody else, um, I focus on kind of three or four that I think are significant. One is use of mobile phone. Hmm. Um, every As I've said two or three times, everyone's on the phone the whole time. Um, but I think when you're a gambling addict, you are on it the whole time. And there are certain times where you almost have to be on your phone. Um, and when it's socially not acceptable, I used to do things like go to the toilet because that way I could be on my phone if somebody said, don't use phone, whatever it might be. So I think that is is definitely one way of, of kind of spotting it. And, and I think we should be more comfortable questioning people in certain situations, whatever it is they're doing on their phone. People are busy people, but it it is definitely it was definitely a sure sign for me. And and a lot of people now say, oh, my word, you were literally on your phone the whole time. The the second is is obviously. Borrowing money, um, if somebody does try to borrow money from you. Everybody needs money to, to live and money is very stressful and some people have a lot more money than other people. But I think if somebody does borrow money from you, I think there's two things or ask to borrow money. You should have a right to question whether it's gambling. Yeah. It's very hard to do it and their reaction will be often very telling. But I think it's important that you do say that um, because if, if you're borrowing money, but also it's then sort of checking with other people um, if they've borrowed money off you. Cause if you're a gambling addict, you, just, you don't borrow one money off just one person. So I think there should be transparency around that. I mean, if somebody needs some money for something, they need some money for something, but, if they're then borrowing money off three or four other people and saying, don't tell them, it's more often than not gambling. But so often people go, oh, OK, it's for that reason. I'll lend you the money. And then they don't speak to anybody else about it. Other things are like physical. Don't underestimate the impact that it has on people's physical um, health, just because mm -hmm. it's a it impacts your mental health. I put on an awful lot of weight. Um, and then people are like, well, it can't be gambling because why would he put weight on? But it was, of course, because I wasn't exercising because I'd rather be gambling. So I don't, I think if you do notice physical signs, don't, I think there's so often a temptation just say, oh, well, it must be something else. Yeah. And it could well still be gambling. Um, and as you just said, I think also it's in those period, it's in those kind of pinch points. A gambling addict will gamble 24 seven. But I think if somebody is watching football at one o'clock in the morning and it is, it's, it's question it. Yeah. Um, because ultimately, if they're doing it for good reason, just because they look, they won't have a problem telling you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're the sort of things, but it is difficult, but they're the sort of things I always say to look out for in other people. 
So as we start to wrap up, I'd just like to touch on a few um, things in terms of what we think society needs to do to, to tackle this problem. The first one for me, um, what do you think of modern day gambling adverts on TV? Because from my assessment, they're very, very good at sort of glorifying the the feeling of gambling or the person gambling. I mean, there's one with a very uh, a famous actor who talks about, you know, the glory of you can travel the world in one night and it, you know, it's really inspiring. And, and you know, there's, there's another um, famous bookmaker that sort of says, what kind of gambler are you? Are you this? And he paints them out almost to have superpowers in the way that they gamble. And all these adverts seem to be very empowering and, and you know, leave the person in a positive uh, spirit and feeling good about themselves for, for doing this. Do you think that, well, first of all, what do you think of modern adverts? And two, do you think there needs to be some sort of regulation on what can be included in these adverts? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge topic. Um, firstly, I think there are way too many gambling adverts. I have an issue with the volume of them. I think we've reached saturation point. I don't think there's anyone in the world who doesn't think there's too many gambling adverts. Um, and so I think there should be a lot less of them. Um, I think it's it's just obscene. Um, I think some of the advertising is quite predatory in its nature because it's trying to sort of hook you in by enticing you into gamble, by offering you kind of free bets or mm. bonuses. I don't <clears throat> think that should be allowed. I think if somebody wants the bet they should do should be able to and, and make that choice and i think particularly with young people that's that's where i worry worry about that side of things um the actual a lot is made of of advertising and i i think maybe too much at times i don't like the glamorization of it the use of kind of celebrities that mm. This is, it's all kind of glitz and glamour because actually it's not, it's far from it. Um, and I think the other thing that's really important about the, the advertising side of things is, is the stuff that goes on that people don't see, which is the kind of once you sign up, the, the barrage of emails and things that you get um beyond that um so yeah it needs to be far there needs to be a lot more regulation in terms of just reducing it all i'm not saying that they shouldn't be able to advertise what they do but i do worry about the younger generation it's illegal to gamble till you're 18 in most forms of gambling and yet it gets rammed down their throat in every way, shape and form from goodness knows how old. Um, so yeah, something, something needs to change. Um, but I'm not one of, the, I'm not one to kind of campaign for things to be removed because I think that will solve all the problems. Yeah. Um, I think it will help, but I think it's only part of it. There was one, um, idea that you mentioned at the end of your book that really intrigued me and it was that you said uh, sort of regulation over gaming um, non-gambling activities uh, especially with children um, and I, I'd never really thought about this much until I read it in your book and then I remember something a friend said to me who he had uh, he suffered with gambling addiction and I every year I set up a, a fantasy football league and but there's no money involved in it like you don't put any money in it and I said join my fantasy football league he said I can't play fantasy football because it elicits very similar feelings to what it felt like when I was gambling because I'm suddenly sat there watching a football game and all my focus is on whether Erlen Haaland is going to score because he's my captain and that that did make me think that Things like fantasy football, maybe that's an extreme example, but they do sort of uh, elicit the feelings that you feel that could one day lead to, to gambling because they're very similar feelings. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and I can actually relate to um, what your friend says, because it, it is true to an extent that said, the consequences aren't quite the same, but yeah. it's, it's your brain. I think when it comes to what I was talking about in the book around gaming is there's a lot of things now that are built into the online gaming world, many of which people don't even realize exist, but things like loot boxes, packs, which are essentially unregulated forms of gambling because it's it's the same thing it's the same yeah. feeling you're buying something to try and turning it into something more and if you don't get what you want you just buy another one it's very addictive in its nature it's designed to be that way and i think a lot of young people now particularly post pandemic the amount of time they spend online playing these games there will come a point where they think okay actually playing a computer game and going up a level or winning is not the most important thing in the world but I like the feeling it gave me. So how else can I find that? And I just have an issue with the fact that that world is not regulated in any way. There's nothing stopping a young person spending an infinite amount or adult spending an infinite amount of time or money on a computer game. Um, and I, I think that worries me. Um, and I, I think there are, it's very definitely a, a potential gateway. Doesn't mean if you, play video games and then you gamble you're going to be but it is a very potential gateway and there are a lot of blurred lines there yeah absolutely it makes a lot of sense to me because um my younger brother he's he's 17 now but i remember when he was 12 years old and you'd ask him what he wanted for his birthday and he'd say i want um whatever they call like fortnight credits because he wanted to open some sort of pack to get what he wanted and he'd use his entire birthday money he'd have like 50 pounds and he would just, it would be gone in an hour on these Fortnite boxes. And similarly, I, I don't think you'll uh, mind me telling this story, but uh, my co-host that I do this podcast with, when we were very young in school, um, we were playing FIFA. Um, he borrowed a, a family member's uh, a card to buy a few um, Ultimate Team packs where you get these random, you know, it's, it is gambling. You, you just get what you get and you don't know what you're going to get. But he really wanted Ronaldo, I remember, when we were young. And he, without his parents knowing, he spent, he just continued to spend on this card and he racked up an insane amount of money that he had to pay back to his parents. And it is, it is, it is essentially a form of gambling. So it's very weird that we, we don't see it that way from a, you know, legally. Yeah. And it's, I mean, what happened to your friend is happening all the time um, yeah. because of that. And if you've got that kind of personality, that addictive nature, you, you just hit the button and it's so impulsive and it's so addictive. The the last thing um, I want to talk about before we let these guys know where they can find you and, and the book is I wonder what you make of the the glorification over um, individuals like a Dan Bilzerian and whose you know, entire story is built on success through gambling. Um, and I, in fact, before before we came on, I had a quick look on YouTube, and if you type in, um, you know, how to how to get rich gambling, how to win gambling, there's a lot of these like motivational videos that feature people like Dan Bilzerian, um, and and his story and how he made millions, um, you know, on on in the casinos and and things like that. Do you think that as obviously there's nothing legally we can do about that, but as a society we have to become more responsible with how we glorify these people whose you know story isn't one that you know maybe it may be one in a hundred million chance of that coming true yeah i i mean i think as you said i don't think there's anything you can do to stop that no um and his story is one that goes in that direction mine's a story that goes in completely the opposite but i think it's about having a kind of very balanced approach um very balanced view on these things i think one of the most difficult things about gambling particularly actually if you if you've if you're really struggling with it is people only ever talk about when they win and you only hear about the people that win and have everything never the opposite 
And so it makes you believe that you could be that person or that you are going to be that person. And if you're not, and you're like me, you're then thinking, well, it must just be me because I've got loads of mates who all gamble and they seem to win every time they do it. And their Instagram, whatever is awash with winning bet slips. And I've just done this and the other. And I think that's the, that's the difficult, but is that's what people's belief is. And there's this misconception that people who gamble win. And therefore, if you don't, shame on you, um, that needs to change um, because it's not reality. But there will always, gambling's about winning and losing and there will always be some winners. Um, but I think people need to appreciate that they're far outweighed by the number of losers, um, in my opinion, anyway. So this isn't something you've asked me to promote or, or, or give an advert for. I, I generally, I, I'm saying this. My younger brother turns uh, 18 later this year. Um, and when I started looking into this topic, it really got me thinking about, I wish that someone had maybe given a talk in his school or, or I'd, I'd maybe reached them at a young age because... I think, you know, if, if I was to go and say, hey, you're going to turn 18 soon, there's, I'm his big brother, he's not going to want to listen to me. But I wish that places like schools made more of a conscious effort because I remember when I was in school, we had people given, you know, we had the police in to talk about drugs and alcohol, but no one ever talked about gambling. Um, and in fact, it, it's very big in schools now because I remember listening to a podcast uh, the other day with a teacher who says that, you know, a lot of the chat that she hears in, in her class or, or when she catches people on phones, they know a lot of these kids are gambling in class. So for, for, for my brother who will be, you know, able to gamble soon, which is very scary for me. I'm not saying he's the type of person that I think, you know, is sort of predisposed to that, but it is a worry in the back of my mind. And I just wonder what sort of impact do you feel you're making when you go into a school and, and you speak to kids about this. And I wonder what the reaction you get from them is. Is, is there a positive one? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there with what my motivation was for doing this is because I had an incredible education. I worked in education and other topics, other things were addressed um, in the right way and often very powerfully. And I thought, well, someone needs to do that about gambling and what I've experienced and, and that's why I wanted to do it um, and it, it, it's not as talked about as it should be and it's it was historically an issue that I think schools could ignore they can't now so I think that's why I, I do what I do in terms of how it's received it's very well received um, I think people find obviously the personal story element quite powerful um i think the other the other bit that's interesting is it it, it kind of doesn't just help people who might be gambling or struggling with something related to gambling it's it's addiction and mental health more holistically but i think probably most alarmingly if that is the right word is when I started doing this, I thought, well, I'm I'm doing this to equip people for life hmm. beyond school and to make more informed choices, better choices than I did once they are in the big real world. What's amazing is actually how many of them are already doing it. And I talk to kids that aren't legally allowed to gamble. And they're all doing it. It's ingrained in culture and society, even at that age. And so I'm like, wow, I'm I'm talking to them now, not yeah. for the future. I'm talking to them now. And so the one thing that never gets questioned is the relevance. Um, very rarely do I ever get, oh, well, no, it's not relevant to us. It's, it is. Um, I think the links to gaming is, it makes it even more, Kind of relevant to all so 
yeah, the feedback I get is is really positive on that front. I do get young people come up to me or reach out to me afterwards and say, look, that's had a big impact on me and I therefore don't intend to do X, Y or Y or that's really helped me right now and that's what keeps me coming back. That's why I do it. I love it, man. Well, we've talked a lot uh, about your book today, Mike Bite. Um, as I said, I've, I've read a lot of books on this topic um, and I'm not just saying it. I think this is the best one I've ever read um, just because you don't really cut any corners. You don't skirt around any facts. Um, and I think it's the best example of someone trying to explain what the emotional side of it is. Um, you know, I think a lot of other books I've read on the topic, they they give you the facts of what they've bet, how they got there, but it doesn't really explain the sort of dark side of it. And so it's not the easiest read in terms of, you know, it, it can get a bit, you know, dark sometimes, but an unbelievably good book. So where can everyone listening and watching uh, find the book for themselves and connect with yourself on social media? Well, firstly, that's very kind um, and very much like the motivation was to raise awareness, to help people understand it on a different level and, and hopefully reduce stigma and, and help people who might be in that situation. As we always say, it's available in all good bookshops. Um, you can get it on uh, Amazon. Um, I There's an audio book as well, which is how quite a lot of people like to digest books these days. And um, yeah, I mean, if fancy reading it, I'd be very grateful. Um, social media wise, I'm on Instagram at Patch Foster and Twitter at Patrick Foster 02. Um, and you can get more information about what I do day to day, the, the kind of talks that I go in um, and deliver in schools and, and organizations. Um, and obviously, I'd be delighted to to link up with anybody that, that might be interested in me speaking anywhere. Um, and also, most importantly, if you are struggling um, and you do just want somebody to, to talk to or to listen, who's not going to judge, who's, who's been there, um, please reach out to me. Um, I will get back to you. And I'm not a therapist or a counsellor, but I will give you some advice using my own experience. I'll be there to listen and I will direct you in, in the right places to where you might, might be able to get some more support. Um, but um, I'm always always there if, if you need me. Amazing. Well, I will make sure that the link for the book, your social media um, and all other resources and help that we've mentioned are all in the description below. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be in the description. If you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, just swipe up and the links will be there. Patrick, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's been an absolute pleasure. As I said, I thoroughly enjoyed your book and I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for having me. It's been great to chat. Um, and keep up the great work. The podcasts are really good listen. So thanks.